these symbols are mostly to do with Bible prophecy. These symbols of heaven and earth, uh, sun and moon, fire, earthquakes, beasts and rivers, they're all very much related to, to Bible prophecy that we see through the Bible. Um, Bible prophecy, as many of you will know, being the foretelling of events in the future for the sake of the people down through time to give them encouragement, reason and hope. So tonight's class is really just an introduction to these things, we'll, and, and I hope it will be a foundation to <coughs> Bible symbols as a whole. So we could just cross out the fact that this is prophetic symbols, and really what I'm going to be focusing on is trying to give a, a foundation um, and some operating principles that underpin all Bible symbols, whether they're prophetic or not. So tonight's talk is important. Why? Well, because so much of the Bible, when you stop and think about it, and you know, you've got to put yourselves in the, I've grown up through Sunday school, so you've got to put yourselves in the shoes of someone who, who comes to the Bible for the first time and reads it. And and I presume, and if you were like me, if you stopped and thought about that, then there would be a lot of things in the Bible that we would be starting to scratch our head about when it came to some of the language and the literary structure that is in the Bible. And one of them is this idea of symbolism. There's visions and dreams, there's there's figurative language, there's allegories, there's types. Um, however, we can't say, well, okay, these things are a little bit difficult for us to handle, so we'll just you know put those in the too hard basket. As we all know, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Not part of it, not some of it, all of it. And therefore, it's our prerogative to understand as much of it as possible. Don't be daunted by it. And I perhaps am describing it as something that's hard and serious, but when in fact it can really be quite fun when we come to having, having a look at, at some of these, um, these symbols in scripture that we have to start to think a little bit harder about and uh, and to try and understand. And this is, in fact, part of the reason for why God has written the Bible in, 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 it, uh, in this way. It's, as we'll go through tonight, absolutely vital that we are familiar with Bible language. So tonight's talk is not so much about showing examples of biblical symbology, as I suggested, but this will come in the next five classes over the coming weeks. Tonight's class is about establishing a foundation for Bible symbology. So we'll go through these main points tonight. Hopefully we'll answer these simple, basic questions. What are biblical symbols? And what I want to show is that all symbology, all dreams and visions, all allegories, all types, all of those things are founded on metaphor. And if we understand metaphor, a simple fact of metaphor, then it's really easy or it unlocks a little bit um, these seemingly complex Bible symbols sometimes. We'll ask the question, well, why has God used them? Why has God used Bible symbols to portray and convey his message? And then finally, we're going to ask, well, how do we decipher them? And perhaps I'll share with you some keys that we might use to unlock or um, highlight how we go about deciphering biblical symbols. And then we're going to look at a line as an example at the end. Okay? So feel free to button and ask questions as we go along. Um, so... What I hope you will come away with tonight is a feeling that Bible symbology is not unattainable to understand, but actually at its core, at its simplest, it's quite easy to understand. It's simple. So what is a symbol? Well, a symbol is simply, uh, Wikipedia would say, a mark, sign, or word that indicates, signifies, or is understood as representing an idea, object, or relationship. Or put simply, a visual image or sign representing an idea. But it doesn't even have to be a visual image. That could be something that we conjure up in our mind. It could be just a word or an expression that represents an idea. Such as a person calling you a rock. 
to illustrate how they think that you are strong and steady and dependable because that's what a rock's like that's the attribute of a rock it doesn't change it's always there it's strong steady and dependable or a person who constantly bothers you you might describe them as being a thorn in your side it's another symbolic way of speaking okay we know these we're totally familiar with this way of thinking we uh, we associate something else with the basic idea that we are trying to portray. So when we come to the Bible, as I mentioned before, symbology and all the varying degrees of it are used extensively. So we might start with just the basics at the bottom being symbols. And as we move up this ladder of complexity, we come from symbols to uh, to parables, to type patterns, to visions and dreams, and then to master types and theme structures. But they're all based on something very simple to begin with at the bottom. And so I really want to just start simply and look at, look at, 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 um, at that. So we'll, we'll begin simply and we can build up. And I'm not saying that, you know, that the Bible is super simple because it totally isn't. That's what makes the Bible interesting is there's always something new to learn. So the fact that there are symbols and parables and allegory makes the Bible interesting and it keeps us wanting to keep looking. It's important to appreciate that symbols, types, parables and allegories and the widespread use of dreams and visions are actually all the same thing and they operate on the same principle and that principle is metaphor. So metaphor uh, is the basic principle of seeing similarities in the form of metaphor or simile uh, it underpins all bible symbol in every form so at the basis of all bible symbology is this principle of metaphor and uh, and it's what we mean when we say we have to look for the attribute of the symbol is we're, we're trying to find this idea that shows the similarity between the point that you're trying to convey and the word picture that you're using to help convey the message so you're trying to show that uh, that similarity so uh, a metaphor as i said is the basic principle of seeing similarities in the form of metaphor or simile it underpins all Bible symbol in every form. So we're going to really just have, have a good grasp of what this means. Sorry if this is a little bit technical and boring, but it helps to then expand our thinking as we go into Bible symbology. So let's look first of all at simile. A simile is when we compare things and see one or more similarities. We then say that one thing is like something else. So, for example, Psalm, hope you read, can read that. Psalm 77 verse 20 it says, Thou leadest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So, we can see there that there is the word like in this verse. And he's comparing uh, one uh, element with the word picture of a shepherd. So, a flock of sheep led by a shepherd's hand... This is the simile, is like the nation of Israel being led by Moses and Aaron. So that's quite easy enough to understand, isn't it? So this, you know, we actually do this all the time. It's, it's something that we do naturally. Uh, this is the way our brain works. We think in this sort of way, and we use like in our sentences often. It's to help solve problems and to understand things. So in fact, our minds and Bible symbology are made for each other. So God knows this, and so he's written the Bible in this way so that we can compare and contrast and show similarities between things so that we can appreciate the principle or the point that he's getting across better. So when we consider a metaphor, it's really just the same thing, uh, but without the word like. It's not quite as obvious. So a metaphor is just an extension of simile. In the case of metaphor, we go one step further, and rather than saying a thing is like another, we say it is the other thing. So in essence, a simile and a metaphor are identical 
except that the word like has been dropped. So for example, Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, we could make this a simile, couldn't we? Thy word is like a lamp unto my feet and like a light unto my path. So really, simile and metaphor are both based on comparing two things and seeing a similarity between them or on this attribute that uh, the simile or metaphor is portraying. It's the sameness that's the basis for making a simile or metaphor. Um, so hopefully that's uh, that's easy to appreciate. So in, in, in it, in it, what I'm trying to say is metaphor is the foundation for all symbology and allegory in the Bible. So let's just uh, think about some examples of, of Bible symbols. We have, you know, there are just lists and lists of Bible symbols um, and allegories and types and, and word pictures that are portrayed in the Bible. All of these things here are um, uh, symbols that are used extensively in the Bible. Swords, wine, bread, honey, fruit, lions, doves, a lamb, the world or the earth, there's stars and, of course, serpents. So, you know, we, we can think about all of these things and we can already start to think, you know, even if we didn't have a fair idea about the Bible and Bible symbology, if we were to look at, uh, you know, a, a sword we would be quite um, reasonable in thinking, you know, like if we were to put a sword into a sentence and use it as a symbol, then we would be thinking, okay, the, the, the sword is sharp, it is used for, uh, used in battle, so perhaps this is, the attribute of this symbol is going to be something about um, war, or, um, or, yeah, up something along those lines. So all of these are Bible symbols that are used extensively, and they all have different attributes or ideas, don't they, associated with them that we can already sort of start to think about um, as we look at those those images. Um, so you may have been wondering why we read Psalm 1 as uh, our reading tonight, but it's really just to give an illustration of Bible symbols, not obviously prophetic symbols, but it is a really good illustration. So if you're in uh, Psalm 1, just want to perhaps if we can all go through that especially verse 3 and just pick out the uh, the metaphor that is in verse 3 so it says there in Psalm 1 verse 3 he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper now Psalm 1 here is actually more than just a metaphor, it's, it's what's called an extended metaphor, as you can appreciate, because there's more than one idea that's being contrasted or compared in this verse. There's a tree, it's planted, it's by a river of water, it brings forth fruit, it brings forth fruit in season, and the leaf doesn't wither. So there's these six ideas, seven ideas, that are being portrayed as a, as a, um, as all of all of them are different symbols that all diff represent something else. They all uh, have a different word picture associated with them, and they are all metaphorical of something else. So, if we were to put that up here, we have a tree, and we know that in the context, and we're not really talking about how to decipher a symbol at the moment, but in the context, we know that it's talking about a man, don't we? Because verse 2 says, but his delight is in the law of, of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And so what we find in Psalm 1 is that this person or this tree is representative of, or is portraying the idea of, is metaphorical of, a person. And he's planted, he's established by God's word for good works, and he appropriately receives eternal life. So this extended metaphor, you can see how it works. So a tree planted by a river of water and brings forth fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither is like a person who is established by drawing sustenance from God's word 
and they do good works at the right time and their life will be forever. So Psalm 1 is a good example of Bible metaphor and the use of symbolic language because it's more than just a tree. It's more than just being planted. It's more than just a river. These are just words that highlight the idea that is trying to be taught. And this is what all of Bible symbology is about. But when it comes to the Bible here, you might ask, why does it need to use so many, well, you might say weird symbols? Why use metaphors in a way that seem literal? Why didn't God just say what things actually were? It says in Hosea 12 verse 10, that this is what God has done. He says, I have spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. This is the same idea of symbolism, of figurative language. I've spoken by the prophets. I've multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. So God uses this type of literary structure and form in the Bible. So why? You know, this is exactly the same question that the disciples asked Jesus for why he spoke in parables. So come with me to Matthew chapter 13. You know, there are, there are many ways, and we'll touch on a few of them, but this is probably the, the main reason, because it's what Christ said to the disciples, as to why he spoke in parables, because parables really are just an extension of metaphor and Bible symbology. Matthew uh, chapter 13, I'm going to read um, verses 10, 11, and 13 to begin with. So the disciples have, have come to Christ and they've, they've asked him, well, why do you speak in parables, Lord? And uh, it says in verse 10, the disciples came and said to him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? He had just mentioned or spoken about the, the sower, the parable of, of the sower. Verse 11, he answered, Jesus answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And then verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So this is interesting, because Jesus here deliberately spoke in parables, so that only a select few would understand what he was saying. Only those who had the keys to the puzzle would understand him, and the rest would hear, but they weren't really listening, and so they wouldn't understand. So this is a vital key to appreciate. The Bible is packed with symbol, metaphor, type, and parable, so that only those who dilig diligently come with the right attitude can hope to gain an understanding. Because we, we see that really in, in the context, and we know that he's quoting from, from uh, Isaiah, that the Jews that he was speaking to, they were hard of heart. They were unwilling to really listen to the words of Christ. They came with a proud, selfish attitude, not humble at all, and so they weren't receiving the words of Christ with open ears. It says in verse 15, For this people's heart is waxed gross, the ears are dull of hearing, and the eyes they have closed. So they weren't really listening to, God's, to Christ's words in this instance. However, the disciples, and for those who really did come with a humble mind and with the right attitude, and who were willing to be diligently thinking about what it meant, then they would appreciate the parable. Christ also says an unusual statement, though, in verse 12. It says, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. So this is both a sober warning, but also a wonderful promise. So those who understand will increase in understanding. Those who have the right attitude and do approach the word in humility, and who are diligent in their reading of the word, they will increase in understanding, but those who do not will lose what little they have. So this is the foundation to Bible study, and it's why we should have such a focus on reading the Bible with an open mind every day, because more understanding is the foundation to more faith, 
and more faith brings more action. And so also further to this, an appreciation of biblical symbol and type is really essential to understand prophecy. This is a, a, a simple fact. Prophecy is packed full of symbols and metaphor that won't be understood at all unless we appreciate how the Bible works in this way. And you can think of Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, or the book of Daniel, or the book of Revelation. How could you hope to appreciate or understand the symbology, the dreams and the visions that are in those books uh, without having uh, an understanding of how God has written the Bible and appreciating um, that way of writing? Other things we ought to consider when we ask the question, why? Why did, why did God write the Bible in this way? We've said, well, it's so that we have to actually give our diligence. We have to approach it with open mind and open heart. That's point number one. But look, I don't know about you, but symbols, from my way of thinking, they add color and zest. They add a challenge. And not only that, but there's a practical reason for it because once we do appreciate it, then they aid in our, uh, they aid in the memory of that concept for us, don't you think? So, you know, if we can tie a concept or, or an idea to a word picture in our brain, then that makes it so much easier to keep it there and to remember it. So I think all of these things, why you symbols, why has God used symbols, well, all of these things make up the answer to why God has written the Bible in this way. So, how do we decipher a symbol? Well, perhaps the first thing we should always do when we approach the Bible, not because we have a huge respect for the Word of God, but because we also want God's help in coming to an understanding of some of these concepts and ideas. So perhaps we ought to pray for help. Just a simple thing, but probably the most powerful thing to stop and remember uh, at the start. Then perhaps uh, these three things, and perhaps look, you know, if anyone else in the audience, if you have some more ideas, then uh, sing them out. But for me, these three things, if, if you go to any, Bible, any chapter in the Bible and you, you read a symbol, you, you come across a symbol that you don't quite understand or appreciate, um, or you feel like you haven't quite got it, then if you take these three key uh, elements off, then it will greatly aid you in trying to understand what that Bible symbol is talking about. So number one, understand the attribute of the symbol. What do I mean by that? It's like, uh, it's the idea that's behind that symbol. So the water, if we think about water as a symbol, water gives us life. We can't survive without it. Okay. So it's life-giving, it's sustaining. That's the attribute of water. We have to, first of all, look at the symbol and think about the attribute. Otherwise, we can actually go wrong. That's at the basis of it. That's the metaphor. That's what I'm saying. Is That's the simple thing we've got to get our head around first. Then we have to read the passage in context, look around the verse that we're, we're having trouble with and, and see if we can see any contextual evidence as to what the symbol is. And then thirdly, and this obviously takes time in the Word and we've got to have a, an, an appreciation for, for the Bible and, and the other stories of the Bible, we have to consider Bible echoes. But word of warning, we could think immediately of a Bible echo when we're thinking of, of a symbol, but once we've got one symbol in our brain, then it doesn't always mean it's the same in every context. And, and we'll see that shortly. Because it's all about, first of all, considering and appreciating the attribute of the symbol and then applying that to each context that that Bible symbol might come up in. Okay, right. If you could turn with me to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 29. And this is where um, we'll work through this example of the symbol of a lion in Scripture 
and hopefully um, <clears throat> perhaps some of the younger ones might be able to help with, with us uh, to, to, to do this as we work through it. So Isaiah 5 and verse 29. So consider what this symbol might be talking about. It says there, their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. So we might come to this verse and we might be doing the reading for the day. We might be fairly new to the Bible. And we're looking at this verse thinking, the roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar. They shall lay hold of the prey. So what's this talking about? Or is this just literally talking about a lion? Or is there something more to this verse that we need to appreciate? So can anyone kick me off or give me an idea as to where we could start by going when we look at in uh, Isaiah 5 verse 29? What's this? This is obviously a lion. But what's it talking about? So the roaring shall be like a lion. So all of a sudden we're thinking, okay, so that is just like a lion. It's not necessarily a literal lion, isn't it? So you remember those three things? We've got to understand the attribute of the symbol. We've got to read in context and we've got to, we've got to consider Bible echo. So how about contextually, can we find some answers in the context? Yeah. That's right, and as we read through those verses from verse 26 onwards down to verse 29, it's the same group of people that we're talking about. We're talking about uh, 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 nations who God has called to from afar, and he's going to draw these nations down to do something, and this is in the context of the judgments on his people. So it's not just a lion, is it? It's actually a lion that's roaring. So what is that kind of trying to portray? Do lions roar when they're hungry? Or when they're angry, I don't know. I mean, these are the things that we've got to think about because this is the, this is the attribute that's being portrayed here that then we apply to the nations, or to, to in this case the Assyrians and the Babylonians, based on the context. But does this mean that we then go and say, well, therefore, in the Bible, all lions, when we come across a passage where it talks about a lion, that we're talking about Assyria and Babylon? We're not, are we? And this is where context is super important. And this is why I love the lion as an example, because you think about some other passages in scripture where there might be, we might talk about a lion, and it's talking about someone very different to these two here. And that is that lions are strong, they're fierce, they're leaders, they're the kings of the jungle. And so they could be, depending on the context, either for bad, the preeminent nations of Assyria and Babylon in judgment on the nation of Israel, or they could be for good, uh, Judah or Jesus Christ, a great, strong leader, powerful leader. So we have to appreciate all of these three things when we're looking at Bible symbology. Not just the context, not just Bible echoes, but also looking at the attribute at the foundation of these symbols. What is being Try, what is trying to be conveyed by this symbol? You can that, that holds true for every symbol that you can think about. Um, and, and so at the core of it, we've got to appreciate that idea and concept of metaphor and simile um, because that's the, the simplicity of it. Um, does anyone else want to do put another one up here because I've, I'm nearly finished and it's quarter to eight. Or we can finish up and have questions. The lion roaring. Oh, when? When he calls the prey. Oh, when he's caught it. Yeah, okay. Yes, right. Okay, so he's, he, you're saying he's done it. He's completed the judgment. Yeah. Yes. So there's all sorts of different facets, isn't there? It's lovely. And there's lots of different shadows and shades and uh, elements to these to these symbols. And if we were to just say that, you know, the Assyrians and Babylonians were going to come down and take you, Israel, then we, we miss the colour. We miss 
all of that flavour that the symbol of a lion roaring provides for us, doesn't it? And I don't know about you, but thinking about Revelation and and, and if it was all just literally laid out for us, this nation was going to come in AD 1568 and take this nation by this means, it would be utterly confusion down through time um, with people and leaders trying to sort of, you know, uh, trying to dissuade or, or, or change the course of, um, of prophecy or foretelling. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Zechariah and the and the and what is it? There's the the bowls and the pipes and the olive trees and the scrolls. And they're all in the same. Like you know, it can get quite layered up and quite complex if you just look at it quickly. But when you take it all apart and you simply and methodically, you know, remove each one and think about them as just a symbol. Try not to picture it as like a picture in your brain. It's like the dragons and the ten, you know, the ten horned beasts in Revelation. They're, or, or Revelation 4 with all of the elders around the throne and there's lightnings and, and rainbows and it's just way too complicated. It's actually just, we're talking about each symbol represents an idea. Perhaps just in summary because I really like this quote. Oh, sorry, I do have a summary slide. The operating principle behind all Bible symbology is metaphor, comparing two things and seeing a similarity or attribute. And the key reason for why the Bible is full of symbology is so that only those who diligently come with the right attitude can hope to gain an understanding. This seems to be the emphasis that's placed by Christ and also at the start of Revelation. And we interpret a symbol by using three keys, as it were. Understand the attribute of a symbol, read in context, and consider Bible echoes. Now, here is, just to conclude, a verse that makes use of uh, the idea of metaphor it says whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts so this metaphor of a weaned child uh, is the, the who we're trying to um, close in on is to these people who are going to be taught knowledge we're weaned from milk and in the new testament we go to meet. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. And this is how we become familiar with the Bible, is doing it daily, little by little, and coming to a fuller appreciation of all of God's literary forms, Bible echoes, and everything that we've spoken about tonight.